Uh, my name's Sid Kurz. This is Shining Light on Energy and the Solar Industry uh, 2.0 because I recently gave a talk. Well, not recently. It was in April about this and it kind of um, not exploded, but it became like a current event in that a lot of uh, people overseas started talking about it and I hadn't actually seen the recording, so I don't know how they got that. Knock on wood. Um, so yeah, quick disclaimer. It's independent research, educational purposes only. I have no affiliation with anything in this in this presentation. Uh, all the research is done in good faith. So like, you know, you can get away with a lot if you say you're working in good faith, especially in the United States because they just changed the law. Uh, all of the slides is Creative Commons zero and everything else belongs to the owner of its uh, brand, etc. There's all my social profiles, things like that. And um, we're graced with Joe Grand at the front here as well. <laughs> I was going to say, I do some hardware attack training too. Joe Grant's obviously one of the biggest uh, inspirations for me personally, so big shout out to that guy. He's right there. So buy him a beer later. Um, if you're buying one for me, I'll offload it to him. So this talk is suitable for anyone who uses electricity. So as a raise of hand, who uses power in this room? I've seen a couple of people that don't. So um, <clears throat> that's fine. I mean, it's not a big issue, but uh, we'll get into that. So who am I? I'm, I'm just some dude, right? I'm some dude. Well, you know, I'm just a good intentions hacker. I follow the law. I'm also just the messenger. So, you know, don't shoot the messenger. I'm sure you've all heard that phrase before, meaning that, you know, don't go after the person who's bringing you the news. And you hear this all the time with bug bounty. People go out and they like submit bugs and they try and like sue them or put them in jail. Um, that's not going to happen to me because nobody knows my real name. Um, <clears throat> yeah, what I'm not, not a threat actor. Uh, I might look like one. Uh, I'm not an expert. Well, not, you know, not an expert in uh, most fields, but... It's also not a lecture. It's going to be some sort of session where we read between the lines. And I want you to keep that in mind. I'll do it now. Like Read between the lines. So when I show you something and then sort of be like, oh, that kind of applies to something else that I do in work or in life even as well. It's not. It shouldn't be too technical. Um, that just vibrated. That's all good. Yeah, so who knows what this is? Who's done power before, like electricity and stuff like that before? Anyone? No. Who's got a power meter at home? And it goes like this when it, when the power when the air condition is running. Yeah, this is the one that sits next to it. So I don't know if you have it in Thailand, but you've definitely got it overseas. <clears throat> it's a ripple control receiver. Um, basically, what happens is oh, there's a better photo. Ripple control receiver. So AC power comes out like this, and then there's something called a ripple, and we'll get into that. This is where they go. On oh, this is an old meter board. This is like some someone who needs an upgrade. Okay, someone who needs an upgrade. Easy to start fires with things like that. Not a good. Not a good. Uh, board per se, but this is the new one. The smart meter is the EDMI Atlas MK. I assume it's Mark 7A or something. It's got, you know, SIM cards, all that stuff. I don't know if they use them in Thailand yet, maybe in, in some places, but um, <clears throat> it allows disconnection and reconnection of electrical services remotely. And, you know, as I said before, reading between the lines, clearly there's risk involved there. Uh, obviously, you can use it for remote billing purposes. You know, if somebody doesn't pay their bill. You just you don't have to drive out there and cut the wires. You can just like send out a command and block the meter. Right? It makes sense. Yeah. And then think to yourself, who would you want to control that? Um, <clears throat> something like a central bank digital currency. You know, something like that. But anyway, um, <clears throat> cool. So this is what a ripple looks like. So normal normal power goes like this, right? Even if you don't know what it means, it should be like that, like a sine, sine wave, just up and down. Ripple is these little jagged edges on there. And that machine that I showed you earlier, that detects that. Right? It detects that and does something. In fact, um, there's a demo on YouTube. This is a really good video. Like It has the whole works in a power station. Um, and you can see on the top there, right, it's got two different numbers. One's for the cheap power, like during the day, and one's at you know, a different price at night. And that ripple, when it goes over the wire, it changes the, the tariff, right? And the video is really good. It's actually an audible sound too. Now, <clears throat> you can send those ripples out uh, with a machine, right? And this is one of those ripple control transmitter machines, massive machine. That's the RTS 640. And then we've got the 640, 660, sorry, 600. This one here is life-size, a bit smaller, something you could carry, maybe not in a backpack, but um, we're getting there. Um, something like 11,000 volts, 20,000 volts, 30,000 volts. You can um, send out a, 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 a ripple and basically do something special. And that's like an old one, 22,000 volts. You can see the size difference. Like this one's in a small container little thing. Uh, and actually you can buy them prefabricated. So you get one of those, custom, portable built, whatever, prefabbed plants. Uh, in fact, you can drive it around. So 
you know, you get one on the back of a truck and then you get this mobile connection grid, right? A little mobile grid. Um, and then, so what happens when you send out a ripple, it actually turns off the load. So it basically disables power until the signal, uh, or the ripple is disabled. So basically it's like a, it's like a, zzz, and you can actually hear it. It's actually human audible. <clears throat> so you send out that signal, uh, it should be human audible. And then once, once it's gone away, or another signal's received, it'll turn back on. So think about what I'm trying to say there. I'm trying to say we're doing like a sort of like a denial of service in electrical grids, right? We turn, we send out a ripple, easy, right? Send out a ripple, turn off everyone in the area's power. Kind of, kind of weird, right? But that's, that's a hardcore way of doing it. That's like the hardcore way. So, you know, we've got TCP IP connected to those boxes as well. So maybe we just hack into it remotely and then influence the grid. Um, <clears throat> but what else is connected to the grid? So I want you to think of what, what would be connected to the grid? So we got, you know, appliances, things like that, homes, meters, power stations. Well, a lot of things. Uh, and I'll go one thing here once we, yep. Solar. Who's got solar? Yeah. Who, who's got like, who knows what, who's got like one or two little panels? Maybe they've got like a solar battery power charger, something like that. Right. Anything, anything solar, right? Or, or even solar, solar garden lights. Who's got solar garden lights? I do. I bought them from Home Pro the other day. So Home Pro. Good place, by the way. I love that place. Shout out to Home Pro. <clears throat> um, so yeah, so in the US for the first half of 2022, about 40% of all new electrical generating capacity was solar. So all of the new stuff that was coming onto the grid, it's not coal, not gas, not diesel, it's solar, which is kind of cool, right? It's like renewable energies and all this great stuff. But who looks after solar? You know, who looks after solar in the United States? Well, it's the person who owns the house. We've got Joe here. You know, he, he probably goes out there, checks it every day, makes sure it's at least making some sort of noise. And there's no smoke coming out of it, things like that. Or energy.gov. This is the United States, right? Energy.gov, big department. Uh, there's another one there called CESER, the Cybersecurity, Energy Security and Emergency, Res Emergency Response Team. Uh, and there's another bunch of stuff in there, including FEMA. Who's been to Australia? Australia. Anyone been there? Oh, just me. <laughs> okay. Well, well, I was born there, but yeah, lovely place. Anyway, cre clean energy regulator. So this is the, the regulator for the energy, uh, system, I guess, for, for, for especially renewables. Clean energy council, uh, is sort of like the, the tick off box for it. And they're actually going away apparently in 2024. They just sort of stepped down, which is kind of awkward because I don't really know what's going to happen after that. So, um, but why is this, why is this interesting? Well, the household owner, oops. Just yeah. the household owner effectively becomes the the guardian of the grid. So if you think about all of the security implications that you would put at a big coal plant or a big gas plant or a diesel plant or whatever, all of these individual people like Joe become the guardians. And I'll, uh, this is a joke, by the way. This is like a preppers thing where they're like, anyway, taking care of their own stuff. Uh, you get this system. So in the US, we've got like all these massive systems here, right? These are all interconnected and can influence each other. Uh, some of them cross, cross borders between Canada. In Australia, it's a little bit different because we're a massive place with a lot, not a lot of things in the middle of the country. And they actually connect all up and it's kind of cool. You know, a lot of different things going on. We've got biofuel, biogas, hydro, coal, et cetera, solar. Um, you know, when you've got a lot of space like that, you can put a lot of solar panels down. And I know a lot of people in Thailand are definitely picking up solar. Um, you know, you go on Facebook, if you type in solar on the search bar on Facebook and then close the app for the rest of the week, you will get ads about solar nonstop. I typed in the other day, I typed in like table and then I just, or shelf, shelf. And now I just get ads. It's like 2000 baht, two and a half thousand baht. It's like, you know, like bam, bam, bam. And I'm like, I don't need it. well, I kind of want it still, but anyway, um, South Africa, this is a really important one. Okay. So South Africa is a you know, a relatively wealthy nation as a whole, right? It's got a lot of resources, very, very interesting place in the middle of Africa. Challenging situation. <clears throat> 2011, these are all the uh, the state-owned uh, power companies. Because there's been such a problem with theft of cables and a lot of corruption, things like that, there are so many independent power operators now where people have said, look, you guys can't even look after your own grid. We're not getting power. We get blackouts. We're just going to make our own. So they just make their own grids. Like sometimes they're solar, right? sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're, you know, I actually did work for uh, one of the, one, one client, I think two or three years ago, who had Raspberry Pis 
in container ships with solar panels on the top and they were just like standalone units and they would just power all day and we could remote into the Raspberry Pis and basically, you know, we could switch it off. Uh, off wouldn't do that because people would be out of power. But um, yeah, in the US, that's that energy uh, regulating response team that I talked about. And they're focusing now is on distributed energy, you know, kind of like what I showed you with the South Africa. Well, it's like all over the place. We want energy all over. We want everyone having their own little grid, their own little system, their own little solar system, maybe even mini nuke, mini nuclear solar systems, right? That's in the future. So securing these massively distributed grids, kind of like blockchain style grids, like where there's, you know, people are literally running nodes of, of the electricity grid. Um, and this talk is not about uh, crypto. So, <clears throat> but what is a distributed grid? So that's what it looks like. We've got a present grid, which is the, well, that's the old grid where you've got a couple of power plants, big ones, probably government run, heavily subsidized, all these things. On the right, we've got the future grid, right? The future grid where there's like, you know, little power stations. Everyone's got their own little station. Everyone's taking care of their own product, right? And I want you to think, keep that in mind. It's distributed, kind of like a decentralized autonomous power grid, believe it or not. So what happens when the power goes out? Well, or what, or what happens when the grid supply voltage drops? That's kind of what that means. Um, yeah, chaos, right? Chaos happens like madness. I mean, you, you've all, who's had the power go out in their place in the last one year? Has anyone had a blackout? Right. And you know what it's like. The fridge goes off. You know, if you've got an electric water pump, the water stops pumping. You can't have a shower. It's like all of the food goes to waste. But anyway, we'll talk about that. And what, what if you had a Tesla? You know, what would you do with your Tesla and the power is gone? So, as I said, I Googled, what happens if you can't charge your Tesla? And the answer, according to Google, was the car will stop. So it's, it seems obvious, right? But apparently people are searching for it because there's a lot of uh, suggestions. Um, <clears throat> someone might want to report it as inappropriate. I don't know, but yeah, it stops. Believe it or not, the car doesn't work. Um, and I've got a demo. Do you want to, the, if the guys want to put that demo on, you can text his girlfriend. He's, oh, he's busy. <clears throat> you want to chuck that demo? The demo videos? All right. Thanks, man. The little demo. Hopefully the sound, uh, Sound, sound, sound. After almost a dozen automated vehicles clogged city streets, San Francisco Board of Supervisors uh, Supervisor Aaron Peskin said uh, Friday night's incident in North Beach is just the latest problem involving driverless cars. As Crown Forest Teresa Stasio reports for us tonight, Supervisor Peskin says expansion last, last plans must come to a halt before the situation becomes dangerous. It was an alarming scene, but one, San Francisco official says, is becoming too calm. San Francisco Supervisor and Board President Aaron Peskin says he is working with the city attorney's office while calling on federal state regulators to step in before something dangerous does happen. Cron 4 News obtained documents showing five separate cases where AVs blocked emergency vehicles just last week. Supervisor Peskin says that is on top of 50 other documented cases. I mean, if what we are learning is that when cell phones are not operative, they cannot remotely assist their cars, uh, that, that's the kind of instance that can happen in a disaster, whether it's a Lahaina-type disaster or a Loma Prieta earthquake disaster, when you lose cell phone service, that's the precise moment at which San Francisco would be needing to deploy emergency apparatus, fire trucks, ambulances. Peskin says he's deeply worried as the California Public Utilities Commission last Thursday granted a broad expansion of AVs. This is a impressive new technology. We don't think we're going to put the genie back in the bottle, but we want it to be rolled out in a way that's safe for San Francisco and San Franciscans. A cruise company spokesperson says that they are continuing to investigate last Friday's bottleneck and didn't respond about steps to curtail expansion or legal yeah, steps to slow back, the right, roll yeah, of these AVs. Cool. Teresa Stasio. Oh, yeah, the fade out. Nice. Um, yeah, so what we saw there was quite funny, right? So everyone's rushing to put it's in, it's in one of the home cities of people sitting in this room. Uh, driverless cars, missing uh, cell phone reception. Cell phone, cell phone tower goes out. Cars immediately stop in the middle of the road, block emergency traffic, you know, kind of a disaster, right? You can tell. So what I'm going to show you is um, something related. Just keep that in mind as well, by the way. So, you know, thinking to yourself, well, if I was going to start World War III, 
in a city that had uh, autonomous cars, what would I take out first? What would I take out the first? The power, the 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 the, the f- cell phone reception, all these things, and something to keep in mind. You know, don't don't jump the gun. This is my opinion. You know, maybe don't you know rush to these sort of investments, such as like you know, one hundred percent solar, without looking in the in the backyard and and taking stock of what you actually have before you do it. And we'll get into that. So during disasters, you know, the cell phone drops, as I just said. And the autonomous cars just simply stop in the middle of the road, block traffic, block emergency vehicles. Just when you literally need it to work, they stop working, which is kind of bizarre, right? Uh, and crews, apparently they have to half their fleet now. And I, we know some of the guys at Cruise, obviously, um, top hackers, Charlie Miller and Chris Valasek, legends. Yeah, that's what it looks like. Oh, that's an awkward. <laughs> I just shouted them out. <laughs> no, nah, this is a joke, by the way. These are the Steve Buscemi eyes or the, the Brendan Fraser meme. But no, nah, I love Cruise. Uh, it's just a... Awkward moment. This was last week before the disaster in the north of, uh, oh, sorry, the disaster in Hawaii. And I want to make, I'll make a point about that shortly. But what about electric planes? Now we just heard about stopping electric cars. What about electric planes? Um, well, apparently it's a priority. So just making sure that, um, NREL, which is the, you know, some best practices thing, they're looking at it. They're taking care of planes. So, you know, who would, who, who wants to go on electric planes? Yeah. Cool. Me too. Um, just to try it out, like, you know, anyway, so distributed energy resource cybersecurity framework best practices, some study there, really interesting paper. And I also noticed on that paper, it discusses requirements for having a distributed grid, right? It says you need to have an administrator. Uh, what have we got there? We've got, uh, you know, personnel controls, account management, configuration management, uh, identity management, you know, personnel planning, you, know, you need to have a force protection person. You know, an OT person, an emergency planning team, compliance officer, HR, blah, blah, blah. And as I said earlier, um, it's literally anyone who has a solar system. So if anyone's hiring, um, if anyone's hiring for any of those positions, let me know. Cause you know, you, you're going to need all those people to manage the grid. It's kind of, it's kind of awkward. So what really happens when the power goes out? <clears throat> Uh, this was a video, but I'm not going to play it. But, uh, South Africa is suffering from something called load shedding or just, just, it's a it's a chaotic situation in South Africa. They every single night at six p.m. roughly the power goes out until five a.m. They literally turn it off. Why? A lot of reasons. But they're having they're calling it rolling blackouts. It's actually load shedding, uh, but they're starting to call it blackouts. It's a different word. So they're on stage four. They've got up to stage seven before stage six, and you'll notice people stop sort of talking about it a lot because it's actually it's actually normal now. It's so. It's so prevalent and every day that they just stop caring about it now. It's part of the part of the thing there. Um, you know, the bars stop operating. You can't do anything in a in a restaurant. Um, you can't paint your nails without the without using your iPhone as a as a lamp. You end up going to you know non renewable sources of energy, right? <clears throat> diesel generators. Everyone's burning diesel. The price of diesel goes up. You know, fumes and stuff like that. You know, the the traffic lights stop working. This is a, this is not Google Maps. This was actually a video in that clip that I showed you. Um, it's like you know, at six or seven o'clock at night here, when the fl- lights just go flashing and you can do anything you want at the lights. But you know, emergency services, emergency vehicles have problem getting to you know things on time. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, electric cars stop charging. We talked about that. Water stops pumping. I mentioned earlier. Okay, another one. Refrigerator stop. Mo- the motor in the refrigerator stops pumping. Air conditioners stop working. You know, data centers go to die. Okay, so if you don't have power long enough at a data center, it dies, right? In certain ways. <clears throat> and cashless payments stop. Okay, so you can't use, you know, people, some, some countries are moving to a cash, cashless society. No cash. You know, you go up and just, if the power's not there, how in the world do you actually buy things? Like, how does things work? Um, and and even on the ready.gov, which is the disaster uh, planning website in the United States, it says any food that has been exposed to 40 Celsius, which we're all got freedom units, um, imperial, whatever it is, 40 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, Celsius for more than two hours should be discarded. It's not even, you can't even eat it anymore. So like a brick of cheese, well, cheese is a bit different, but something like a milk, you know, or, or something different, discard it. Now we're talking 6 p.m. to 5 a.m. every night. Like, how would you, how do you survive with all that? How do you survive? Now, I originally gave this talk, uh, in about April, a different version, it's heavily updated today. I added about a hundred slides and deleted a bunch. Um, and this is before the Maui fires 
everyone's familiar with the fires that are going on in the United States right now. There's like a, there, sorry, it was last week, tragic fire, over a hundred people, 800 plus missing, terrible, terrible situation. <clears throat> the Maui fires and the electric grid, bit of an issue. Okay. Um, yeah, as I said, it's a tragic event, not to be taken as fact. This is just a little bit of opinion based on what I spoke about last time. So there's the island, um, Maui, and there was the situation of recorded incidents, I guess. Top left is where most of the damage was allegedly seen on, on some of the videos and things. We zoom in, and a lot of damage was done, right? A lot of fires occurring. Now, if you go to Google Images and we zoom in on that area, just a generic area, and now I don't know if these homes have been destroyed, but I assume, uh, I imagine a lot of them have, or neighbors, or even affected by it. But there is a lot of solar in this area. If you zoom in, almost every single house has solar, right? If we zoom out a bit before, I'll go back. Ha look how many, a lot of them, solar hot water is like the square one, but a lot have solar. Now, all of these are independent grid, uh, distributed energy grids. Now, you can imagine what happens if a fire wipes out, what, what would happen if something burned out half the Bitcoin nodes in a Bitcoin network it would be wouldn't even work properly anymore right half the half of it was missing <clears throat> similar situations very difficult to recover um power from a distributed grid if you destroy every single node um as an example this is the the hyatt regency in uh, in maui i'm pretty sure this wasn't un this was unaffected but they have a lot of solar as well covered covered in solar solar is great by the way i'm a big fan of solar i used to sell solar so that's why i know so much about it right very challenging road ahead for that uh, that place. Uh, monumental rebuild in, involved. What is catastrophic failure? So catastrophic failure, you know, destroyed in like a in like a cyclone, um, you know, burning out like that, things like that, or snow in Japan, you know, destroying thirty megawatts. That's a big. That's a massive amount, right? Thirty megawatts. The average home is like what five kilowatts. So it's thirty thousand divided by five. <laughs> Alamo 2 had issues in Texas. Alamo 2 is in Texas, right? Yeah. So damaged by hail. Hail destroyed. Um, you know, you can imagine what a, what a coal fire plant would do during hail. It would probably survive. A bit different for solar. Um, but n not, not saying that, uh, we absolutely need solar. Absolutely. Uh, severe weather issues for solar. So there's a tool called the FEMA risk tool. FEMA is like the, something emergency response uh, organization in the United States. And you can go and see where disasters will affect. So we have avalanches in there. We've got uh, f coastal flooding there, you know, earthquakes all over, hail, heat waves, which is actually not too bad for solar, right? Hurricanes, you know, et cetera, et cetera, strong winds. But is solar a big enough energy source that we have to worry about this or do we have to worry about someone hacking into it? Well, in the US, 2.8% of renewables allegedly is solar. Uh, in Australia, something a bit higher, but it's on the up, okay? It's on the up, and we need to make sure that it's it's not hack-proof, that's the word for it. It needs to be looked after. People need to start doing a little bit of cybersecurity research into the stuff that's in solar because a lot of it is connected. Um, solar may only be a small percentage, but uh, it absolutely is higher in places like the United States, uh, Hawaii, and Australia. Um, significantly higher in some places, like I showed you previously. So 20% of the grid in Hawaii is solar. So 20% of supply is solar. After a disaster or after some sort of ransomware maybe or some sort of attack that I'm sort of getting into here, uh, it would be 17% lower. So it takes something between three to 10 years to build a new energy source such as a coal fire plant, you know, or maybe we're talking about uh, mobile uh, uh, nuclear grids in the future, but that's in the future. So, like I said, I presented this in, I uh, presented these Hawaiian statistics earlier in this year. So, just sensitive of the current event. So, Hawaii is a great example. Solar power is 20%, small scale, distributed, 10th highest in the United States. Let's look at the airport. So, this is the airport here, covered in solar, covered in solar. Zooming in, you can see the panels. Everyone sees what I'm talking about, the, the little blue squares everywhere. Um, <clears throat> it's a literal one-to-one -one risk map. So if you can go on Google Maps, you zoom in, you can actually spot solar systems that you can hack around the map. And if we zoom in further, we'll find out what type of panels they are. We can figure out what sort of year they were made. Maybe they're 2012, maybe they're 2013, maybe they're 2015. Um, East-West, it's something about power all the day there. But this is an older arrangement style. So typically now they'll do south panels or maybe maybe even flat because solar is so powerful now. 
darker panels, higher efficiency. We're sort of doxing panels here, okay? So higher efficiency, newer style panels. Uh, newer panels equals Wi-Fi and shit. So if the newer panels, the darker panels, nice looking system, it's going to have Wi-Fi, right? It's going to have one of those dongles on it. In fact, I have a dongle here and I'll get into it in a bit as well because this is what we're doing. <clears throat> I'm just sort of setting the, setting the tone here about what would happen if you screwed with it. So yeah, system here, Hawaii Airport. These are the new ones. These are quite new. The other ones were like this, east-west, like angled. These ones are like kind of flat. Um, in fact, there's actually a write-up installation of 3,000 panels at the at the airport, 2019. Um, $600 million in savings, largest state contract in the nation, massive undertaking. Zooming in, there's the car park. There's a car park down there as well. Solar system on the car park. Great. Go and park there, right? So you go and park there, sit under there. Awesome. You can see all this cool stuff on the roof there. In fact, there's the inverter, that thing there. You can just, yeah, it's right in front of you. In fact, you can probably literally walk up and just turn it off, right? You can just turn it off. There's no key or anything. Just turn it off. Disable the system. Wow. So secure. So, um, and I want you to think about that. Just turning it off, right? Turning it off, turning it off, and then power's gone. 17% power's gone, you know? You know, in Australia, 30% renewable target, pff, gone. You know, if you turn it off, right? Think about that. Just keep it in your mind. Oh, I did the eyes again. <laughs> I don't know why I did that. Yeah. So what about Brisbane Airport? Who's been to Brisbane, Australia? Has anyone? Yeah, okay. So Brisbane also has a massive solar system. Have a look how big that one is. Like that is, a, that's like one of the biggest systems I've ever seen. Massive system. Um, and you can actually see how literally covered the entire airport is in solar. And if we zoom in a bit, <clears throat> we can sort of see some sort of like cable runs and assuming they're going around the corners and things and there's some sort of panel up there. Yeah, zooming in a bit further. Um, and there's a video of it. So you can go and scout out the system first on uh, YouTube and there's a video. They give you a big upgrade video. <clears throat> you can see where they're running through the hallways. You know, 750 houses worth of solar in one place. Imagine cutting off 750 households all at once. <laughs> Gone. There's the cable runs. I mean, you can go up there and cut the cables, but we're going to do that uh, in a different way. What about what? So, what was that box that I could turn off? What's that box? That's the inverter. Who knows what an inverter is? DC to AC power. So, like maybe you've got like a water pump or anything, and it just turns it from DC, which is just bzz, into like a wavy current. And um, Joe's probably got a much better explanation for that. But <clears throat> so, what is a solar system? What is it? It's a bunch of panels which just generate current. And then you've got an inverter, which turns it from direct current into power that can go back to the grid or use around the house. Um, oh, I thought I deleted that slide. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's that's the example of it. So there's two types of solar panels, right? There's monocrystalline and polysilicon. Mono is the sorry, poly's the old one. It's the chunky looking one. You've probably seen that little thing before. That really nasty looking solar panel. That's really low efficiency because that was made like really really crudely. The new version is really, really nice. It's act, in, in fact, it's the same uh, way they make CPUs, right? The same way they make the fabs, uh, the silicon wafers for a fab. They literally, you know, they seed it up and they cut it up and then they chop it, chop the edges off. That's why solar looks like hexagons, little edges. They're actually curved because it's a circle and they just chop the, yeah, and then they tessellate it. They're actually curved edges. And that's what they look like. You can buy them. Uh, they're not even that expensive too. I mean, they're, they're expensive in the form that they come in, but these are... Just sand. It's literally just sand. Silicon, right? Silicon. And then they chop it up like a wafer for, 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 um, you know, like the same as it goes into a CPU, like TC TSMC. <clears throat> um, on the up, the mono version, much, much, much more efficient. The darker the panel, the more efficient it is. On the rise, massively more efficiency, huge potential for, for supplying a lot of power to a lot of homes. And you dope it with a bit of boron or all phosphorus one or two sides, and you get this, who's done chemistry before? And I'm joking, it's not, it's not going to be a hardcore lecture, but yeah, that's what you get, you get a little bit of a gap, a little valence electron spot, and then pff, you got power, that's it. So the darker it is, the more power, the more, the more you know, pure. Um, and then that helps you ID the panels via the satellite, via the Google Maps. You can just get on the Google Maps or, you know, some sort of uh, imaging software and literally see you know, what people have on their houses. You can actually tell, typically tell what kind of inverter they're going to have, whether they've got Wi-Fi. Say you're hacking a bank, for example, and they've got solar. You go, oh, okay, they've got that color panel. They've got like a deep blue. I've seen it before. Bang, bang. You can sort of get the target before you even get there. These are the panels. 
typical brands are not very important today because they don't really do anything. They're just, inver- they're just uh, inert. But the inverter is the Wi-Fi thing. The inverter is the Wi-Fi thing. It's got monitoring. I'm not talking about mi- micro-inverters, but uh, they've got monitoring. And a lot of them are made overseas. We've got Austria, China, China, Germany, China, and um, three Chinese ones as well. Most are made overseas, um, <clears throat> typically by China, in contract, or uh, Solar Edge is an Israeli one as well. And um, I've I've installed, I've got dongles for most of these ones, but I've got a Huawei one here. I've got the dongle for the Huawei solar inverter here. Uh, and we'll get into this because this has got some cool stuff on it as well. So this is the thing that you can, that, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it shortly. Um, <clears throat> so what even, why would you want to monitor your solar? You know, why would you want to monitor solar? Obviously, you know, to get uh, you know, the Wi-Fi, yeah, that's funny. So the Wi-Fi monitoring is for, you know, Statistics. You want analytics. You want to know whether it's working. You want to be able to update it, things like that. So can you, with all that stuff that I told you earlier about turning it off manually or turning it off fire fire or turning it off fire, things like that, who here thinks that it's um, a great idea to put these on solar systems? Okay, great. No one thinks so. <laughs> That's great. So, yeah, yeah. Um, who would have had a different opinion at the start if I told you? I'll be like, oh, who wants to put these on their solar systems? I would have put my hand up, I guess. But yeah, so can you cause catastrophic failure with one of these that this just sticks in the inverter? And I'll show you. And the answer is obviously, yeah. I mean, let's have a look. Let's have a look. <laughs> so what do we look for? Well, let's find some software style limits. Maybe there's some sort of like code that says, don't go over this limit. It's probably too high. And then it blows up, right? Like I showed you earlier, the big fire on the roof. Maybe there's, uh, you know, maybe it's by law, it's supposed to be under a certain amount, um, all sorts of things like that. Maybe there's terrible code, you know, terrible uninspected code that is uh, vulnerable or defective by design. That's my favorite one. I think they're a, a, a hard style dance group. Uh, I know a song called Defective by Design. It's a great song. Potentially bad, bad installation. Maybe somebody installed it in a negative way. Maybe it was installed incorrectly. Maybe it was installed with all of the all of the security features disabled. And a lot of people probably got experience with that, right? Um, maybe it's got some sort of large, maybe centralized sp- single point of failure. You know, maybe there's something that controls all of them. That would be ridiculous, wouldn't it? Uh, yeah, such a centralized control. And we're talking about distributed energy grids here. We're talking about distributed energy grids. Like everyone's supposed to be the guardian of their own little th- system. And in some cases, a lot of these systems have dongles that go back to a centralized system, which basically means that it's no longer a distributed one. It is a centralized system, which makes it just as dangerous as any other uh, situational uh, thing like this. But we'll get into that. So NERC, uh, I'll probably skip through these slides, but basically cyber is a massive issue in the United States for the electricity grid because they have a lot of problems with ransomware. Yeah, we've had the gas pipeline go down. We've had agriculture getting hacked. Personally, um, I did some agricultural research. You probably seen, may, some of you may have seen before. Um, cold weather, we talked about this earlier, can make those events, uh, can make load shedding happen. Load shedding is that thing in South Africa where they turn the lights off every night. So <clears throat> it's, it's a very real possibility. Uh, cyber can absolutely influence that, you know, geopolitical events, vulnerabilities in the, in the products. Uh, bold adversaries. That's probably the best word for it. People who just, just want to make wreak havoc and they're from all over the world in every different country. Inverter issues. Maybe they're really poorly designed, things like that. So can we, what about if we use one of these to generate a failure? Can we just blow one of them up? Probably, right? Um, I've got another one here that I've de, the, um, I've taken the, 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 who was in Joe's class this morning? Or the last three days. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, so we can go through that. But what about pushing malware to the inverters? Can we push malware? Can we ransomware someone's inverter? Like, how? Imagine ransomwareing a distributed energy grid that's that's literally impossible to fix because the person to fix it would have to go to every single house and fix every single node. Practically impossible, right? Seems pretty weird that someone would uh, want to do this, but that's what we're doing right now, right? So, can we drop maybe? Can we drop 100% of the, this is a Huawei one, but can we drop 100% of the Huawei ones? Can we drop 100% of the Solar Edge ones at once? There's absolutely the possibility that that could happen. Can we force a weather event? That one's obviously not possible, um, but I've heard there's things like cloud seeding and uh, chemtrails. <laughs> chemtrails. Yeah, Huawei. So Huawei's a good example because I've got one of them here. 
Um, massive company, right? Uh, massive company. Big in Thailand too, right? Big, big sponsor of solar in, uh, this is the PV magazine. This is the photovoltaics. PV meaning photovoltaics, which is the word for solar. Um, <clears throat> big sponsorship with them for that. Uh, this is the inverter. That's the thing that goes on the wall that you can turn off. That's the app. That's the solar app for the Huawei. So we've got, you know, how much we, did we yield today? How much did we consume? Is the battery running? Is the grid running? Um, there's a JPEG from their website, quite an interesting picture. Uh, it's obviously not real because they need wires, not uh, blue lines. And yeah, another important thing is they use the high sync. Uh, is it high silicon? Yeah, high silicon. So they use the sanctioned free, well, according to China, the sanctioned free chips, the high silicon ones, the big ones there. So that's like an STM32, but it's the size of like a 50 cent coin. Um, <clears throat> Totally immune to sanctions uh, in this relevant climate, right? High silicon there, very interesting chip, unique, uh, totally made um, fabulous or something like that. So yeah, fabulous from Shenzhen, owned owned by Huawei, uh, immune to sanctions, and powers the solar inverter um, chips. This is what the grid situation looks like on your home thing. We've got the app, a monitoring portal. And the smart dongle. There we go. The smart dongle. That's what this is. There's a 4G one, which has a SIM card in it, which I think is obviously, I think personally it's worse. And there's a WLAN one. And this one actually has an Ethernet port in it. So you hook up to it with your home Ethernet and then you can basically, so you jack into that and it just goes off. Off it goes. It starts connecting to the servers overseas, starts rel- uh, relaying information back to, um, to China to the server, sorry, in China that controls your monitoring. Um, that's the one I've got here, I think. And there's a QR code on the front. Yeah, this one's got a QR code as well. Different password. The password's in a sticker. So if you walk up to it and you look at it, you can just get the password from the sticker. So if you scan that, um, it actually comes up with um, yeah, high voltage 2022, 22A, blah, 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 reg key, password change me. So mega secure password. Um, and there's actually, a, I don't think you actually can change it or it's really difficult to change, but I, they're all, they're all of the same passwords. Just change them. Capital C, sorry. Um, and you can imagine when someone goes out there to installs this, they're not going to change the password. Like if they change the password, the next time someone, they ring up, Oh, I'm having problems. They, you know, they get out there and it's like 20 minutes, 30 minutes. You know, oh, you changed the password on me. And then the, you know, it's just a troubleshooting nightmare. Absolutely change the password, but it's not a common thing. You know, we're talking about problems that can go wrong, and there's a lot of them. Plug and play, like I said, just plug it in, and then bang, you're on, you're online, right? You're connected. Uh, it's rated as dust tight. This is pretty funny. IP65, IP65, protection against water projected from a nozzle. So I don't know why they have that, but it's quite a funny um, situation. IP65, dust tight. Now think about that. What? Why would it need to be dust tight? And protect it from a, from squirting from a nozzle. The answer is because <clears throat> it goes outside, right? It's an outdoor product. So where does the dongle go? Well, if you stick the inverter on the wall outside of the house and you plug this into the, into the, into the inverter, um, yeah, is there anything, does anyone notice anything odd with this? Does anyone notice anything odd about that situation? The reason is, um, it's basically outdoor Ethernet. So you, who, who's, show your hands. Who's ever ran an Ethernet cable through the wall, drilled a hole, and then drag it out to the street? No one? Apart from CCTV. Yeah. Okay. Sweet. Yeah. Cause it's quite insecure, right? Cause like, obviously, if you've got an Ethernet cable hanging out your wall, someone can just walk up and plug into it, right? And just take over all of your stuff, install some dirty certificates on your router, and then steal all your banking. So applicable defenses. Maybe we can run, you know, dynamic. Um, we can re- DHCP or DCHP. I always get them mixed up, even though they're the same thing. We can maybe we can isolate the inverter so that even if somebody jacks in on the street, they run up to it and they put their laptop in. Maybe we can isolate them. Maybe we need a VPN. Or maybe we need a you know, demilitarized zone inside of the network. These are all really hard for the electrical solar installer, who's probably doesn't give a uh, doesn't give a rats about about any of this stuff. He's like, look, my job's done. Bang, you're off. But if you add up all of those instances of people sort of letting go and saying, oh, you know, it's not that bad. It's something a little bit of a overseas monitoring that we don't control. We don't know anything about or a little bit of a VPN issue. If you add all that up over the distributed grid, it is a serious problem. 
Like imagine if that was just like a, imagine if Cisco did all that, you know? Um, the new version, SIM version, arguably worse. You can just go up and drag the SIM out and then like basically, you know, I don't know, you connect to that. Uh, and actually I ordered, I ordered one with the SIM card and then they looked it up and said, Oh, Thailand doesn't have the SIM version. We're sending you two, two Wi-Fi ones. I'm like, dude, no, two, two Ethernet ones. I'm like, dude, I literally ordered it for a purpose. They're just, yeah, Alibaba, great site, by the way, or AliExpress. He's trying to help me, but he actually, you know, he actually ended up doing the, the opposite because I didn't need two of them. Uh, try not to dox anyone here, by the way. All of the following slides occurred in Minecraft. Who's played Minecraft? It's sick. Um, this is a Costco in Minecraft that you can visit. And, um, it's obviously a rooftop solar system, multi-story, um, with the power, lot power, because really strong power coming out of solar panels suffers from cable resistance. So you got to, you got to make it as short a system as you want. So shorter, the better. So typically the inverters, those boxes and these are on the roof. And the roof is typically accessible by fire escape. So in Minecraft, uh, I mean, uh, sorry, to avoid fires and allow rapid shutdown. So you can go in a, in a, in a fire or, or the fire, fire, um, you know, the fire, what are they called again? Firefighters. They they're going to want to turn it off straight away. Turn it off because it's, it's high voltage. So, um, they're generally accessible from the street, from the, from the, from the thing. This is a random public library in Minecraft. Um, and if you zoom in on the roof, you can see there's some sort of cable run again. And if you look at that, you can zoom in and there's like a something there you could play with. But if you think about a library, um, thanks Google, by the way, for, um, Google Minecraft. But yeah, think about that. So why would you want to get into a, why would you want to hack, hack into a library's Wi-Fi anyway? Cause it's 5G towers up there. The library probably has free Wi-Fi anyway that you can connect to, right? Uh, the library's not that important to me. But like I said earlier, just, just reminding you to read between the lines. Like think about, okay. I want to hack a, a power station. Well, that doesn't make sense because the power station is not going to have solar panels on it. Yeah. I want to hack, uh, something like that. Maybe a stadium, maybe like a, like a bank or a building or an office, you know, physically and as well as, as network. Uh, I go up in the nighttime, like at the San Diego International Airport in Minecraft, where they have a massive car park. And you can see again, we've got a bunch of those little inverters up there that you can probably reach up and turn off again. So just mucking around with it, you know? Um, <clears throat> Another one there, don't I just random, random commercial products. But I, I want you to sort of get, get your head around the, the, the prevalence of how many solar systems there are and the inverters. This one here as well. I don't know where this is, but it's actually on the street level and that's a walking path and you can literally just walk up and pull the dongle out. So like, like that's, you know, like who would do that? Right. Crazy, right? Crazy. But that's what people do. They just install them anywhere. They just go bang on the wall. You know, take my Ethernet out of the house. I don't give a shit about my banking details or my Gmails. Just pff, chuck that in and then hook up the Ethernet to it. Crazy, right? Crazy. Um, another one there, just randomly sitting there. So, oh, yeah, that was all in Minecraft, by the way. So, yeah, according to CISA, the number one place to get into somebody's network is through the uh, the home router. And an Ethernet cable to the home router sitting outside of your house is instant access to all of your network in the home. Um, I love this photo as well from the Huawei website. It's pretty funny because like they're sitting out there in the yard. It's like, dude, you have a perfectly good house right there. Why don't you sleep in the house? It's like, it's a pretty funny photo. Obviously they're camping, but whatever. Um, so when have you ever installed your internet outside of your house other than like a CCTV system, which kind of makes sense, right? IP cameras, but they've the DVR, which is the video for your, for your, um, for your webcam network. They're typically fully isolated. Typically, I hope so. They would isolate that off hardcore because of this problem, right? Because of this problem where people can just go up to the network camera, pull out the camera, and then hack the rest of the network. Imagine if you did that in like, a, I don't know, like a, one of your offices in the city, right? You went up, pulled a camera out, and just hooked up to the network, and you're on like the global network. You can sniff all the other cameras, blah, 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 and just hack everything. Um, <clears throat> you know, what are the solutions? You assign a physical IP to the port you know, isolate based on Mac address. These are all just like phantom uh, problems. You know, like I said, VPNs, VLANs. Is that too much work? Well, um, how about centralized control? There's an app, okay? They have an app. And think about that. When you get into the app, what can you do? Well, uh, I don't know if people might be familiar with this, but Huawei's apps aren't, aren't on the Google store at some stages. But um, to get the app to monitor your solar system, you can't, you can use uh, the app store, iOS, right? I have the app on my phone. Um, on the 
Android phone, you must go to the perfectly secure Huawei app gallery. That's fine. I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying that's their gallery. They're totally unrelated to the Google gallery. Um, and then it says, if a system warning message appears during installation, press OK. So, I don't know, it's pretty funny itself. But that's just the beef that they're having, you know, Huawei and, and Google uh, Play, I guess, are having some sort of issues with that. So, and there's a question there. Why can't I find the app on the App Store? Well, it's not available. You have to download it from Huawei, which makes sense, right? So, you go in there to the ad check, the virus check, the manual check, which is, um, I think the third one's kind of sus to me, but anyway. Um, and then you install this, right? Install this app. Two million installs of an app, right? Two million installs of the Fusion Solar app. So, that's two million plus Solar systems, which is probably a lot of solar, right? A lot of information, a lot of monitoring. Real-time energy flow. Globally, get the system anywhere. So, cool request. That's me mucking around on their network, just sending in my username's admin. I'm number one, you know, 200 response. Um, it's really grainy, and I think I compressed the images too much in the PDF, but sorry about that. Yeah, so it worked. Success, true. Bang, I'm the admin. Whoa. Um, yeah, so a bunch of, uh, <laughs> a bunch of permissions here. We've got real time status query, you know, create user. We've got, uh, de defect user. I don't know what that means. You know, station create layout, normal things, device inspection stop. I don't know what that is, but it seems pretty sus to me. Device export. These are all the network ones, right? And there's a couple of ones in there. There's a really interesting one, like, um, yeah, like monthly income for the system, real-time alarm, a lot of interesting stuff, right? Defect upgrade, crazy, right? This is all coming from a centralized panel, centralized panel for a decentralized product, which makes no sense at all, in my opinion. As I said, we've got all these different features. Um, back to the dongle. This is the dongle here. So that app, interface, you scan that QR code, right, with the change me password. Great password, by the way. Change, you scan that and that gets added to your account in the cloud, right? So imagine everyone's got these dongles. They've all scanned their apps, right? So a decentralized grid becomes a centralized grid. A single point of failure. <clears throat> and there it is there. Uh, that's, uh, I've got a photo. You can come up and touch it. And uh, I've taken one of the chips off and I'll show you in a sec. This chip, uh, it's probably too dark, but um, I don't know why I blurred that out. Oh, there's another QR code there. That's why. Uh, this is the dongle. Fully, uh, fully in its flesh, probably some sort of UART on there, one for the chip or one for the uh, one for the Wi-Fi or whatever it is, most likely contains the, oh yeah, I had a look yesterday, it does contain, this is the slide from April, it does have the SS SSID of the network and the password just in plain text. Um, these are some commands that we're sending, I spoke to a guy last in April about it when I plugged it in and I was like, what, what is this? Because it's obviously not interfacing, this is over USB, so it has a USB interface. Um, and I want to show you this. Is, this is on their diagram. 10 devices, plus, plus, plus. We've got the master inverter, which is the thing that goes on the side of the house, comes back to the internet and then goes to the management system. So there's literally one global management system for this brand of inverters. Um, you know, I personally would prefer to self-manage my device uh, rather than Huawei manage it for me. That's personal choice. <clears throat> some people prefer that, you know, like in the case of John Deere, um, some people want the data in one place naturally. And I, personally, it's more about like, yeah, so centralized control of a distributed energy grid thousands of miles away. Personally, it makes no sense to me uh, in the same way that John Deere, you know, just likening it to that. So <clears throat> I took this chip off yesterday, had a little look, plugged it into my Tigard. What's his name? What's the guy that made it? Friends? Yeah, Joe Fitzpatrick, legend guy, by the way. Also a professional hardware hacker, good guy. He makes that chip, T-I-G-A-R-D, mad, mad, mad board. Chucked it in my little clamp because it's the easiest one to get it into without it flying all over the place. <clears throat> and we're looking in, we use flash ROM, dump the firmware, we've got an FTDI, Joe knows what I'm talking about, and we get these little binary files from Huawei, 16 megabyte binaries. I'll be done in a few minutes. We're on the closing stuff here. So 16 megabyte binary files from Huawei's board we're dumping the firmware by dumping dumping the firmware of these little chip things right we're dumping the firmware what do we get well i don't know what architecture it was but it wouldn't run in ghidra well it's high silicon so i don't know what's going on there but uh wouldn't run in ghidra um i probably didn't run enough uh there's a bunch of certificates in there and i think i've got a couple of them in here but we're looking into the firmware on the chip what would possibly be on a on a untested board from a custom chip that's probably never been tested. Uh, you know, is it going to have vulns? <laughs> it's like, obviously, it's going to be vuln 
heavy. Defective by design. So let's have a look. What have we got? We've got Modbus, which is sort of the, the interface to the, to the solar inverter. We've got some certificates. We've got Sun CA. I assume that's the Sun or Sun 2000. Sun CA dot certificate, CRT. Um, yeah, there it is there. So we're just looking through, having a look. 16 megabytes. We've got the Tomcat client certificate. We've got a Tomcat client certificate. We've got the private key as well. Just having a look. I don't know if this is for every, every stick. Probably is, to be honest, or it's just one of them. But we definitely know what's going on. It's sending it all back over some encrypted connection, which you can decrypt if you have this, by the way. So it doesn't just defeats the whole purpose of it um, in some cases. <clears throat> uh, I had a look here. That's the Sun 2000. That was the, that was the serial number, I believe. I think so. Don't know what some of the stuff is there, but here we are. I'm just looking through, looking through, looking through. What do we get? We get no oh, WLAN was shut down. Get the peers. Why would a bloody why would a solar inverter want to see the peers on the network? It's like leave me alone. Um, <clears throat> get the IP, you know, all sorts of things like you know f- control. So it could do a lot of stuff. It could do it like they could update this. <clears throat> this is a big call. They could update this because it connects to your router because it's like this one. Connects to your router. They could update this to go into the router, you know, go into the neighbors, and sniff the network, see how many devices are on the network, <clears throat> turn the power off, <laughs> things like that. So, a lot of controls here. We've got like, you know, uh, we've got like uh, response disconnect. We've got like connect, scanning. We've got like getting logs, stop access point because it runs an access point, debug mode. There's a couple of interesting ones I had in there. Get access point Mac, get my Mac, you know, you aren't upgrade. Standard input, output, upgrade. Board rate negotiate, I guess. You know, ARP table, ARP spoofing. Great idea. What a great idea. Um, a couple of things here. I'll just have a look for you. But yeah, a couple of things. Response, you know, blah, blah. These are all the cool functions that this thing does that it probably doesn't really need to do, right? Just a couple of them will do. Um, a couple of cool stuff I saw there. I don't know what RAP means, but typically in hacking, it means remote access Trojan, but it clearly doesn't mean that here, obviously, because it's a, <laughs> it's a commercial device. It may mean that though, but I'm not saying it doesn't. We got the RAT up. We've got RAT bind, RAT close, shut down, get peer, get sock. Like these are all pretty sophisticated, you know, pretty basic network commands, but doing it over the air from a remote server, nothing to do with, um, <clears throat> solar, if you think about it. This one's cool as well. This was the weirdest thing that I saw. This one here. Delay, update, delay, active FE. Don't know what that means, but there's something. Uh, hang on, I want to show you something. How many buttons do we have on here? We've got zero. Zero buttons. So where would the button be that says, I want to accept the update? You know what I mean? Oh, accept update. You know, accept. You know, deny. I'm not ready yet. I'm still driving. You know, you know, when you get an update in the electric car, I don't have one. That's why I don't want one. You know, reboot. But can you imagine having some sort of delay update or like permanently bricking or, or sending out an update and then delaying the update without even accepting it? You don't even, you're not even able to accept it. It just goes, just updates automatically. Something to think about. Um, nowhere to confirm on the dongle receives updates without prompt. Um, can be updated without the owner's permission, I, I assume. It's not on the app store. It's not on the Google Play store. It's a little bit sus, but, uh, the big problem here is if Huawei suffered a breach, imagine Huawei, a rogue employee in the same as any other country in the world, same as any, you know, a rogue employee at, uh, at, uh, at KPMG or a rogue employee at AIS. Uh, the CEO, the CEO is here and he's a good guy, by the way. You know, someone could brick every single solar inverter in the entire world with one click. Send out a command, brick all the inverters, drop the grid supply 20% and basically just put everyone into blackouts for about weeks, months, even like it would be, pandemonium there would be looting there would be chaos food would be screwed up um the <laughs> the problems are, are, are honestly uh you can't even list them all and i showed you them all earlier for that reason so it's kind of like oh wow we kind of need to do something about this right um <clears throat> so the final stretch here so threat modeling who's scared out of their brains a little bit no it's all right it's not too scary so yeah as we migrate from a centrally controlled system um, to the synchronous generator base grid, which is the current situation, the big power plant. And we move to a highly distributed inverter based system. That's their quote. Um, lol jokes. It's actually centrally controlled by a foreign, um, app. You know, it's like, what the hell? Like, it's wrong. So that it needs to be something that needs to do something about it. Can you blow them up? Absolutely. You can blow them up. Uh, you can basically just turn off the, um, turn off the, 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 what's it called? I can't remember. Uh, the export limiting and, 
power limited features and just blows up flames so in australia a lot of a lot of fronius ones austrian ones also you know it's not it's not like you're you're not it's not you know for example in australia we have a lot of solar in australia by the way that's why that's why i sort of bring it up a lot <clears throat> plus i'm australian um solar edge you know you'd want typically you want the person who's installing it to sort of be regulating it in the same country apps in the same country it's all well and good as opposed to you know random places around the world running the apps you know you don't know who's running the app you know um catastrophic activities so centralized control of an entire branded uh, of a brand of inverters you can disable all of them at once with one command they're all updated delay any future updates bricking all solar inverters worldwide for that brand two million installs by the way uh grid supply drop in huawei uh, hawaii sorry i kept getting that mixed up hawaii and huawei <coughs> huawei uh so hawaii imagine you drop the grid by 17 percent you know pff, gone 17 percent of the grid's gone load shedding immediately induced pandemonium traffic light, traffic lights go out electric cars stop <laughs> they were going to stop anyway but um ele- you know emergency vehicles stop things like that it's very problematic power goes out um that's what I mentioned earlier. Uh, um, South Africa stage six load shedding, high demand stage six, because they're doing maintenance on power stations. Um, yeah, so I think uh, damage caused by an overload to distributor. Yeah, so different causes of the same outcome. So to have this problem happen in the same way, um, you know, damage. I don't know why I've got this slide. I can't remember. Oh, okay, the reasons why they're getting load shedding. Uh, you know, they've got cable theft. Um, Breakers being tripped, damage caused by overload, and uh, I think we're on the home stretch here. I've got about two more minutes. Yeah, just two more minutes. Is right? Yeah, yeah, load shedding. So, yeah, we talked about this earlier. They're actually burning diesel to make the demand. They're burning just massive amounts of diesel now instead. So, <laughs> just think about it. Like, oh, we've run out of power and all the all the renewables are busted. Let's burn diesel. Um, makes great. It just doesn't sit right in my head. So, you know, lots of different reasons why this stuff can happen. We need nuclear pretty ASAP, to be honest. Um, so can you induce load shedding? Everyone knows what load shedding is now, where like the power is, they, they, it's to protect the grid, they turn the power off because otherwise the power lines sag and you get fires, right? Can you induce it through this? Can you, can you turn these all off at once? Basically cause pandemonium. And the answer is probably, yeah, it should be pretty clear by now, right? You know, it should be pretty clear. Countries that are susceptible to this sort of attack. Um, whether by its, you know, foreign state or whether it's by someone hacking a centralized control system of a decentralized grid. You know, Honduras, huge solar, Germany, Greece, Chile, Spain, Netherlands, Japan, Italy, Belgium. You know, remote attacks unaffected by weather, catastrophic consequences, reliance on overseas technology, trusting in insecure products that have not been tested. And little to no assessment. Nobody is literally looking at like, who has a Huawei dongle? Who's it? Who even knows these exist? Who learned something today? <laughs> a few hands. Awkward. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, that's my talk. So yeah, cool. Take it easy. Maybe one question because I'm like pretty close to time. Oh, wait, we've got a break on this. Does anyone have a question? Who was, who's a bit confused? Or who has, who's like kind of scared or who's sort of like, yeah, go for it. <laughs> okay, I'll give you an example. So <clears throat> after I did this talk in April, uh, shortly after that, well, not shortly, it was in like about four, three, four, five weeks ago, and I forgot to put the video in today, but it's probably a bit too political. Um, one of the senators in Australia literally said, we need to ban Huawei inverters in Australia. And I was like, holy wow. They must have got the memo somewhere. I don't know how they got the memo. But same with the 5G stuff. And it's, I'm not saying anything about it. It's just foreign nations controlling other people's stuff is a little bit sus. You know, people have their own interests. That's my opinion. Um, and, you know, I don't want someone, it's like, I don't want someone telling me what to do, you know. Um, but yeah, apocalypse wise, I mean, Huawei percentage of the grid, maybe like three, five percent, ten percent in Australia, twenty percent of the grid controlled by solar. Not all not all of that is Huawei. I guess if they teamed up and did it all at once, absolutely. Um but yeah, I think the idea is the distributed stuff is not as what as it seems. Like it's like if, if you think about it in a different way, Bitcoin as a thing, it's all the nodes, but they're all using the same GitHub, you know, for the for the core code. It's like someone pushes out an update, 
it's kind of centralized, you know. Someone someone hacks someone's account at the bit. Maybe they do a full full blown attack, like a something that will be beyond not that, you know, very anyway. Um, does that sort of answer it? Apocalypse Now. Yeah, great movie. It's all right, movie, yeah. <laughs> Old movie. Anyone else have questions? Feel free to jump up and just tap me on the shoulder as well. So cool. Thanks everyone.